My producer just said, I need your reaction to this video. <laughs> no. No! Corey, I haven't even had my coffee. But also, now I need I need to know more. We need to see it through now. Two hours later. Okay, so after a little PG-13 research, I understand the situation. And it makes complete sense to me why they put this video up, because at first when I saw this, I was like, why? If there was an even 2% chance I was related to my wife, I'm keeping that shit to myself. Gun to my head, nothing coming out of my mouth. Which brings us to the question of why would they voluntarily do this? It seems incredibly embarrassing. Well, like, 80% of the things on the internet, clout, and in fact, very monetarily beneficial clout. As it turns out, they share an OnlyFans account. So while this might not be beneficial for like an everyday person, they throw out this weird thing, people are like, what the hell? And then that's it. You've got millions and millions of people watching that first video, which is over 13 million as of recording, with people then understandably going, okay, but are they sisters? Then clicking over to their profile page to see, hey, are there any updates? And then maybe you research a little more, you see their link tree, and then, oh my goodness, an OnlyFans. At which point you realize this is like the whole shtick because they share an account called Not Your Average Sisters. So you just know that a percentage of the 13 million plus people that have watched that video, as well as, you know, this has gotten a ton of free coverage, arguably millions of dollars of free press from places like the New York Post and the Daily Mail. And I can't even imagine the crazy amount of money that has gone their way because of this. And the thing to understand is this is not new both for the internet, but also specifically for OnlyFans. Right? For example, there are other examples that have popped up, like a teacher turned OnlyFans content creator who said that one of her former students got her pregnant and she's keeping the baby, as well as another story with a creator who said she slept with an Instagram employee in hopes of getting her content restored. And specifically with OnlyFans, temporary clout is crazy online capital. And it makes sense. I mean, not the having sex with an Instagram employee part, but rather the, the temporary clout part. Like if I say some outlandish, crazy stuff, that means I get a few extra views on a video. Maybe a sponsor's a little extra happy that we got a little extra bump. But with OnlyFans, the return on investment of temporary clout is huge. Like just to use the they may be half sisters girls as an example, realistically, they got way more impressions and views on this, but let's say just 1% of the 13 million people that watch this video, they went down the rabbit hole, they found the OnlyFans, they paid the $10 to subscribe. That's $1.3 million, and that's without keeping in mind that it is a subscription service, that's without keeping in mind there are lots of different ways that these models make extra money once you subscribe. You're talking about crazy potential money. But of course, the two most famous examples of that, you have Bad Baby and the, the Dr. Phil interview. She then turned that into a music career, and then when she turned 18, that became an OnlyFans thing where she made just insane money, as well as mass of the craft, like Belle Delphine, right? Making headlines, getting a bigger following, then turning that into instant cash. Or you had a lot of people weirded out when she sold her bath water. People outraged when she did this whole like kidnapping themed photo shoot. But at the end of the day, no matter how many people were weirded out or furious, there was a tsunami of cash right behind it. And I kind of share this for three reasons. One, I just think kind of the, the outrage to money business model is always interesting, whether it be in OnlyFans or I mean, <laughs> Jake Paul's a great example. Be, people hate him so much, they'll watch him just to see if you'll finally get knocked out by somebody. As well as this being yet another example that you can't believe believe anything you see on the internet anymore because people just want to get a reaction out of you. And finally, three, if I'm ever trending on any platform because Phil said or did something, know that it's fake and it's just promotion for my new feet only OnlyFans. Which sounds like a joke and it feels like a joke, but also y'all, we're heading into a recession probably. But yeah, that's where I'm gonna leave this story and I'm gonna pass the question off to you. Will you subscribe to my OnlyFans? That's not the question. The question I have for you is whether you saw it before this video or you saw it during today's show, what were your thoughts when you saw that video? Did you immediately think fake? or no, this could be real because it's 2022 and everyone overshares seemingly? Any and all thoughts you have, and while you leave that comment, I'm gonna go uh, change shirts and grow some hair, which is a thing that I can do. And then, let's talk about segregation, and before you ask, no, the Supreme Court has not brought it back. Not yet, at least. But rather, this is a very serious story involving 1955 segregation, and it involves Emmett Till. Right? Because almost seven decades after the infamous lynching of Emmett Till, new evidence has now been unearthed that many hope will help prosecute the white woman at the center of the case. And in case you're a little fuzzy on the details, uh, Professor Phil gonna give you a little history lesson, or as some people call it, evil CRT. It's not, it's just history, but it is an example of one of the worst instances of good old American racism. Right, so in 1955, Till was a 14-year-old black boy from Chicago. Though, where the story takes place is in Mississippi, because he's visiting his family there. And one day, he's standing outside of a country store with his cousins and some friends who dare him to ask the white woman behind the counter for a date. So he goes in, comes back out, he's heard saying, bye, baby, as he leaves. But the woman, Carolyn Bryant, now Carolyn Bryant Donham, she later claims that he grabbed her, made lewd advances, and whistled 
killed at her. Though notably, there are no witnesses to back this up. And a few days later, her husband and brother-in-law go to the house where Till Stang, kidnap him, beat and torture him, and then dump his body in a river. Which, yes, led to a trial of the two men, but after an all-white jury deliberated for just an hour, they were acquitted, which helped to spark the civil rights movement and all that followed. Then, you fast forward to 2017, and author Tim Tyson reveals in his book that Donham recanted her initial testimony, admitting Till never touched her, never threatened her, never harassed her. Not that that would have justified murdering a 14-year-old boy, but it just makes it that much fucking worse. But it's not just the court of public opinion interested in this. The news prompted the DOJ to reopen an investigation and see whether Donham had information that could lead to the prosecution of any living person, including herself. But last December, it concluded the investigation, finding there was insufficient evidence to do anything, with a member of Till's family saying, We're disappointed that no one has paid for the tragic, brutal murder of a 14-year-old boy for whistling at a white woman. But his family is now calling for one more attempt at justice after a team searching a Mississippi courthouse discovered the unserved warrant from 1955 for Donham, charging her for Till's kidnapping. With a document which you can see right here also naming the two men who killed Till, but they both died in the 80s and 90s. And so relatives want authorities to now use the warrant to arrest Donham, who is now in her late 80s and most recently living in North Carolina. With the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation also tweeting, execute warrant now. Now unfortunately, a 67 year old warrant probably not gonna hold up if a sheriff tried to serve it. But you do have a law professor at the university of Mississippi telling the Washington Post that any evidence could provide a stronger argument for a new probe, saying if officers want to pursue this case, presumably they have whatever information they had back in 1955, plus some more. You really could go in front of a judge today or tomorrow and get a new arrest warrant if you think, in fact, there is probable cause and suspicion for a crime. The warrant really doesn't give us new substantive evidence of her role in this crime, but it does indicate she was a suspect at one time and that a judge determined probable cause to arrest her at one time. And so for now, we're gonna have to wait to see what happens. I mean, this is not unheard of. Granted, it's a different situation, but Germany does this kind of thing where they convict 100 year old concentration camp guards. Sure, those guards are gonna die soon, but it's kind of more about justice. And personally, as they do it, the fact that the woman responsible for Emmett Till's death is still alive is like this reminder that shit was crazy not too long ago. It's been less than a lifetime since Emmett Till's death. Like it's so easy for things to feel like a million years away, right? That you read it in a book or you see some black and white photo. Meanwhile, the woman at the center of one of the most horrific racist murders in our history is just like in 2022 watching Wheel of Fortune. But hey, that's a story, some of my thoughts, and now I pass the question off to you, what are yours? And then for your kind of fresh air palate cleansing today, an awesome story, I wanna talk about this Burger King employee. His name's Kevin Ford, he works out in Las Vegas and he had perfect attendance at his job for 27 years. And when people learned about Kevin, they got pissed, not because of what he did, but because of what he got. With a video showing him opening a gift, unboxing small goodies like a Starbucks, Tumblr, candy, some pens, a ticket for a movie. While well, the gift came from a manager he had people absolutely outraged online. With people wondering, why is he only getting this 27 years perfect attendance? Like arguably my job's easier than him and I didn't come in yesterday. How do you not reward the man who's more loyal to Burger King than I am to myself? Though, notably, Kevin is not angry, which more than surprising really, I think just speaks to the quality of person he is. But in a TMZ interview, he said, I'm happy about anything. I'm thankful for anything I get. I'm not, I'm not that type of person. Believe me, I've been through a lot. Though, saying with that, there are things that of course he wants, right? Explaining. If I had enough money, you know, I would buy a new Ford hybrid, some American, uh, it's cheap on gas and get me around. But uh, that's a dream. I, I'm not, you know, aiming for for those things. I'm just aiming to uh, get through the next day. And so because this gets so much attention, his daughter decides I'm gonna make a GoFundMe for my dad. And saying on the page, my dad continues to work there because though he does look young, he is coming up on retirement age and leaving would cost him his retirement. And so with that saying, in no way are we asking for money or is he expecting any money, but if anyone feels like blessing him, he would love to visit his grandchildren. And the internet was like, okay, I hear you on the grandchildren, but here's some money. With the internet slamming down over $275,000 so far. And so on the Today Show, he's talking about it. Uh, it's like a... A dream, a, you know, a dream come true that, you know, nobody could even think of this, you yeah. know, so it's, it's just overwhelming. And then they surprise him with his family. There's this emotional reunion. Kevin saying that all this good is coming his way because people admired his perspective on life. People love to see somebody grateful for something and happy for the little things, which I am. I, I've been through a lot. Everybody's been through a lot. So I look toward the smaller things in life. And you know, I'm grateful for everything. I'm grateful for every day I wake up that I could go to work. And to that, Kevin, I say, I kind of agree. I love your face, but I also think it has to do with anger. That lots of everyday people look at your situation and go, here's part of the fucking problem. There's this good guy, great worker, super loyal. And in exchange for somewhere between a quarter and a third of a person's life, 
they got a Starbucks tumbler. It initially just kind of served as yet another example of people not being appreciated. A reminder that you are just a thing to your corporate overlords. You just have a stellar record and they don't lift you up for that. They'd fucking bury you under the Burger King if it would give them an extra nickel. And so I think we often see in like these feel good stories of the internet going, this is fucking ridiculous. And everyone in their little way with this GoFundMe, like they were trying to write this wrong dollar by dollar, cent by cent. So good on you internet for turning this into a W. But from that, I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor and in fact, a company I'm invested in, Able.com, built for independent creators, makers, and freelancers that makes managing your income as easy as texting. With bank level security, Able helps you manage and unlock the power of your independently earned income. And part of the reason you should definitely check it out, and it's the reason I invested in it, Able's mission is to shape the future of work by helping independent workers like myself stay independent, while also getting the benefits typically only offered by full-time employers like tax withholdings and pay stubs for proof of income, which really comes in handy when you're trying to rent an apartment, lease a car, or buy a home. And the team at Able are so committed to their mission that they're giving away $50,000 in cash over the next 30 days to 30 people who want to make money pursuing their passions. These grants will go to support people pursuing their dream jobs, people they call unemployables for their dedication to independence. Enter now for your chance to win at least $1,000, and Able wants you to do what you love and is willing to help you do just that. So visit able.com for your chance to win. You follow the steps, tell us what you're passionate about, and what you need to do what you love. And then, we need to talk about the future of medication abortions and access to those pills. Right now that Roe is gone, around half the states are expected to ban or limit abortion if they haven't already, and that includes medication abortion. But access to abortion pills operate in this murky gray area because they're federally approved, will still be legal in roughly half of the states, as well as many other countries, and enforcement will be very difficult. With this, you've got top members of the Biden administration vowing to fight for the protection of abortion pills. Experts also saying the DOJ could sue states that have laws banning pills from being mailed, like Texas and Louisiana. But as we wait for all this to play out, the status of where abortion pills are legal right now is incredibly confusing. And so as a result, many pro-choice lawmakers are working to ensure protections for people who come to their states to get abortions and the providers that give them. This including at the federal level, where Senator Tina Smith has introduced a bill called the Protecting Access to Medication Abortion Act, which aims to defend access to medication abortion in states where the right to an abortion is still protected. And in addition to being a senator, she also previously served as the VP of Planned Parenthood of Minnesota. And her bill would codify existing FDA guidelines on medication abortion pills to ensure that people in states where abortion remains legal can always access them through telehealth and certified pharmacies, including mail order pharmacies. Now, with that said, Smith has acknowledged that the bill doesn't have enough votes right now and that congressional action on abortion is unlikely before the midterms. But what we're going to see around these laws, this isn't a sprint. This is going to be a marathon. And so to get a better understanding of this specific legislation, her mindset, the goals, and other ongoing efforts to protect abortion, I reached out to Senator Smith and she was down to just jump into it. I think it's important to start with to understand what the goal is of, of Republicans, which is to deny access to abortion everywhere and every place and um, to put a national ban on abortion. That's what we are fighting against. And if, let's, we need to be real. If Republicans get control of the um, of the United States Senate and the United States House. And if they have a Republican president, we should expect that that's what they're going to accomplish. So what I'm working on right now is to try to protect access to abortion care uh, where it is still legal in this country after uh, the Supreme Court basically eviscerated this 50 year freedom. And what my bill would do is it would say in states where abortion is still legal, you should be able to get access to medication abortion, which is safe and is effective in the first 10 weeks of pregnancy. It's been around for over 20 years. You don't need to go into the doctor to get access to it. You can do a telehealth visit um, and it can be mailed to your home or potentially if you live in a place where abortion has been banned, you could go someplace, go to Minnesota, for example, where abortion is legal and get access to it there. This is a way of trying to add another layer of protection uh, for women, people who are grappling with a, the loss of this fundamental freedom and control over their own body. And re regarding kind of the, you know, the the note of Republicans trying to ban it completely, obviously, if you look kind of state to state, that's not fully the case. But I, I was wondering, as you know, uh, the, the former VP of Planned Parenthood in Minnesota, do you think that there should be a cutoff date while, you know, while we're having this conversation about access to abortions? Well, I believe that the fundamental decision about whether or not to continue a pregnancy, the health Healthcare, personal health care decisions that that entails should be made between a woman and her providers. I do not think that government has a role in that decision. So let's just be real about what's happening here. Most abortions happen in the first um, 12 or so weeks of pregnancy. Abortion in this country has not been legal 
um, after the viability of the fetus unless there's some sort of serious health condition. And that's what happens. It's not like women wake up at 36 weeks of pregnancy and say, oh, I've changed my mind. For God's sake, what happens is that there is a health care crisis that women have to address with their physician. I don't think there's a role for government in addressing that health care crisis. If a woman has a, um, an ectopic pregnancy that means that she could literally die if she doesn't have access to abortion care. Where is government's role in that decision? I just don't see it. Do you see this as it's only a part of or it's the the primary thing of the I mean, obviously, we've seen news this week of a, a breakdown in the separation of church uh, and state, because it does feel like a lot of this is being pushed specifically by the Christian right. And then people are kind of just still voting along with it because the other stuff they're able to kind of make peace with it. Well, I think that's such a good question. We have here, I believe, a I'm an extreme minority that is enforcing its will, its values on the majority of Americans, the majority of Americans who believe that uh, that Roe should be protected and that abortion should be legal in all or most circumstances. But the power of this extreme minority um, is, is changing the, the, the freedom that people have, rolling back a freedom that's been there for 50 years. And why is this happening? How did this happen? Because it has been a concerted effort. And I'm not trying to be particularly partisan here. It's just the reality. Republican senators and Republican presidents have put on the Supreme Court individuals that they knew that they could trust to overturn Roe. And that's where we are right now. And I think it calls into question the legitimacy of the court, as you're suggesting, I think, on a whole range of other issues where we see you know, what looks to a lot of us like a Supreme Court that is um, putting its, its own opinions um, into court precedent rather than following precedent um, and, the, and the, the, the law. Well, regarding the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, obviously, uh, as far as polling, it's seen as like a legitimate part of the government. It's at an all time low. Um, do you think that there's any way to, to to gain faith? Do you have an opinion on expanding the court? I know that uh, President Biden has said he has no interest. Do you have any thoughts regarding the court itself? Well, so I am a co-sponsor of the legislation uh, to add justices to the Supreme Court, because here's how I look at it. Americans are seeing that the court is the legit legitimacy of the court is, is deeply damaged. The question is, what do we do about it? How do we restore trust in the court? I think there are a range of things we could do. Restoring balance to the court by adding justices is one important step, and I support that. There are other things that we could do. The court, for example, the Supreme Court doesn't abide by any clear um, responsibility to reveal who is paying for trips of Supreme Court justices or who's behind the amicus briefs that the justices and the court pays for those amicus briefs. So there's a level of uh, financial transparency that doesn't exist on the court like it does in other parts of government. I mean, we need a Supreme Court and a justice system that people can trust to call balls and strikes, as Chief Justice Roberts said um, when he was appointed. I think that we've lost that, and what we ought to be focusing on is how can we get that back. And Senator, uh, the the last thing I'll ask you, because I'm going to try and be cognizant of your time, is, is it, what's what's a final thing or something that we didn't already talk about regarding abortion that you, you really want to get out there? Well, I think that it is just um, important to understand that the Supreme Court has spoken, but the Supreme Court does not get the last word. There is action that citizens can take, actions that I can take as a legislator, action that governors and attorney generals and state legislatures can take. And in a democracy, and we live in a democracy, we have to bring the power of people's views on this um, forward in all the ways that we can, including at the ballot box. So thank you again to Senator Smith for the time. And, you know, that's a story. That's our, the conversation that we had. And with that or really anything from today's show, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. But until next time, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you next time.